Okay. I'm here, and it's a privilege to to be visiting Canterbury, and indeed to be an adjunct here. Um, I'd like to thank James for his uh, wonderful work in building the program here at this university and in our region of Australasia, and um, and for organising this event. So I'd like to uh, make some broad comments about e-research and the infrastructure agenda in Australia, especially as this relates to the humanities, and then reflect on a couple of major projects that I've recently been involved with. And to answer the earlier question about my, um, what my particular interest in, in this is, well, I've been involved for a number of years in discussions about the future of research infrastructure in Australia on the national level. There's a number of large projects that I'll refer to which are um, building capacity in a very um, practical sense for um, research researchers across disciplines in Australia. And I've also worked on a couple of large projects in the humanities that have, have uh, I think they've broken new ground, but they've also tested the, um, the, the barriers that exist um, in terms of, well, like James said earlier, do we really need new infrastructure always? And what does it really mean to have um, these, these large possibilities and frameworks that are offered by infrastructure? What impact do they have on existing genres and practices and workflows and means of um, collaboration? And I, and I guess it's that particular aspect of it that I'm very interested in. Infrastructure as people, as collaboration, as networks, and as ways of working that produce new kinds of knowledge or perhaps have the potential to. So my experience is that digital infrastructure can be a powerful catalyst for building collaboration across disciplines and with internal and external stakeholders but that there's a really urgent need to develop translational skills across humanities and computing domains. And since 2012, I've been on the humanities representative. And as in many um, committees, there's often just one of these people. Um, the humanities representative on the NECTA project board. NECTA in Australia is our National E-Research Collaboration Tools and Resources Program. Um, a roughly $50 million program that's run over a number of years primarily to fund virtual laboratories and uh, tools that, that operate within those virtual labs. And humanities haven't previously had uh, much of an engagement with infrastructure planning in Australia, but that has started to change uh, quite rapidly recently. And and the focus in future discussions of infrastructure planning in Australia, at least, is that uh, humanities should have a, an equal seat at this table. And indeed, the focus is moving um, away from thinking about things in terms of disciplines that are familiar and more in terms of uh, focusing on complex problems that need addressing from different angles. And you could cynically think, well, this is just a way of making um, you know, appeasing those who, who would argue that humanities hasn't had enough of this funding by blurring the boundaries between disciplines. But I really don't believe that is the case. I believe that there's, uh, the people who are in decision-making roles at the moment, uh, or at least in senior advisory roles in Australia, um, are very much uh, aware of the need for funding to go to infrastructure for humanities and social sciences research which I think, as Alan has just pointed out, makes it absolutely essential to be looking at being on more of these committees and um, really having a, a handle on what the possibilities are. When I started participating in some of these debates about the provision of research infrastructure over the past decade, the dominant conception of infrastructure was about equipment and facilities. And here I think there's also been a change over that time now, and I think it's especially important for the humanities, infrastructure can also be people. The people who, op not just the people who operate machines, but the people who have the knowledge and the skills to do this translational work across the humanities and computing. And that this is as important, maybe even more important, than the purchase of costly equipment. So as technologies have developed, so too have conceptions of infrastructure changed. 
and there have been many different models of infrastructure proposed in, for example, the policy statements of governments and educational institutions around the world, many different models for um, highly centralised data store kind of models, right through to very widely distributed um, transnational global knowledge um, models and, and variations in between. So I think that changing um, sense of what infrastructure is and can be towards a much more distributed model is something that has partly been enabled by um, the forces of globalisation in their many different forms and the fact that we can imagine now, at perhaps in a purely utopian manner, a kind of global connected knowledge community that shares um, standards that allow for data interoperability and, and knowledge sharing and building. A wild card, as it were, I think everyone would agree, is that few predicted that a corporate giant such as Google would end up doing so much of the digitization work that would have perhaps been logical for libraries to be doing. And, and for, for example, it was being called for in excellent reports such as this one from 2008, um, which was through the Australian Academy of the Humanities and um, facilitated, written by Graham Turner, which was making the case for a national digitisation program to be funded through the infrastructure policy programs and work of the Australian government. And those recommendations weren't adopted. And it was partly because so much digitisation work started to go on in the hands of, of Google. And it was also for other reasons, the other reasons being that the infrastructure schemes at that stage in 2007 and 2008 didn't support any projects in the humanities. That quickly changed but the focus shifted towards different kinds of projects that were more to do with bringing together uh, a number of existing projects into large networks that would speak to one another. But as an aside, um, there's a section in this report about digital humanities outside of Australia and it's very interesting to see how limited that view of digital humanities was in terms of the number of projects that was being listed. Um, and if you compare that to wanting to take on that task today, it, it would be an impossible job. Um, and that's, and it's less than 10 years on, but there's projects opening up you know, practically every week and centres and initiatives. And yet, at that time, it felt like a field that could be pointed to um, in a more contained way. And that's partly because the term digital humanities itself had only recently come into currency in, in from around 2004 in the, in the title of, of that key text at that time. Now we mightn't have a national data archive for the humanities responsible for digitisation as was being argued for in reports such as this, but in Australia we do have the National Library's historical newspaper digitisation program, which is reportedly the largest in the world, at close to 14 million pages digitised from over 600 newspapers. And so this is a great achievement, but I, what's probably the, um, what's most often mentioned in terms of the achievement of this project is the crowdsourcing aspect of it, which, um, you can see on the left here 120,007 newspaper text corrections today. That was in one day, um, whenever I took this image recently. And um, it's been incredibly successful in, in as being a, a forum for, and a platform and a, an environment, a community for uh, those interested in the, in the history and culture of, of Australia to, read, to become registered users and to log in and correct the OCR of the uh, digitised newspapers. So um, Trove's success and profile has led to an increasing pressure on the National Library to be a host of digital services and to be a key node for e-research infrastructure in the humanities in Australia. And this makes sense on many levels because it's a trusted custodian um, and, 
and it's and it, this kind of work is taking libraries into entirely new areas and putting pressure on their resources. Of course, uh, digital humanities grew out of libraries in many environments and in many countries around the world, and so this is is it is quite fitting. But I think a comment to make about digitization is that the digitized texts themselves for the humanities form the infrastructure for researchers. It's, the infrastructure is not the machines behind, well arguably not the machines behind the digitization effort. The infrastructure that is being built up is this vast course, corpus of digitized texts. They together are the instruments which researchers use to conduct their experiments and to build their evidence. And when a document is scanned, it's not enough. It's not useful enough to simply have it in digital form. There must be systems to store and work with, interrogate, annotate, correct the digital copy for research purposes. And so those systems, or at least the activities that they enable, also form part of this research infrastructure. In the 2011 Strategic Roadmap for Australian Research Infrastructure, the emphasis appeared to shift for the first time very much in favour of the Humanities and Social Sciences Discipline Group, with a dedicated capability area, as they referred to it, of <coughs> cultures and communities. Uh, this was included for the first time. And the focus also in this roadmap turned from centralised approaches to more distributed arrangements, including placing much more value on data sharing, interoperability, and aiming at facilitating greater collaboration among researchers. The vision was that an interconnected community of researchers would form a vital layer of the infrastructure. This wasn't just in the cultures and communities capability area, but it ran through all of the roadmap. Now, ultimately, this roadmap wasn't implemented in Australia, but it's remained, or at least not in its not fully and not in the form intended, but it's remained a de facto plan and a reference point and will remain very relevant until future roadmapping exercises are undertaken. So this was the last major roadmapping exercise in Australia. The, the working group for this capability area of cultures and communities that I've referred to, which, which I was a, a member of, had advice from the departmental advisers that the terms humanities and social sciences and the acronym HAS should be avoided. In their place are terms such as social and cultural research, which do not narrow the capability area just to any particular discipline group. And this non-discipline specific approach was also mirrored in adjacent funded programs such as the, the NECTA National E-Research Collaboration Tools Program. Uh, in Australia we've had a fortunate situation in being able to have funded on a national scale a set of interlinking and mutually supportive infrastructures that are dealing with discrete parts of a bigger puzzle such as data storage, metadata and discovery, tools, supercomputing, cloud services. This has been built up over more than 10 years and they've been funded over time and during the period of different governments. So this is quite an achievement. And the challenge now is on how to bring these facilities together into a more integrated and um, ut highly, more highly utilised kind of super infrastructure. There's a vast puzzle of sometimes neatly fitting, but other times not so well fitting pieces. Each piece has begun its life at a different time with a different kind of ethos led by a different organisation. Um, and so there's a, a, a national recognition that the more work needs to now be focused on integration of these infrastructure pieces. And again, how that's actually done um, will really determine uh, and lock in, ultimately, the range of possibilities that are offered to researchers through, through the provision of this research infrastructure, into which a huge amount of funding has gone, which is wonderful. It's fantastic. But now, I think, 
um, most people in government especially would, would agree that now's the time to draw value from this and to find what, uh, the best ways for it to be utilised across all discipline areas, including the humanities. A really important status report has just been published in March 2015 and I just want to highlight one finding from it which is that, I'll quote, the Hass discipline, so it's the humanities and social sciences or arts and social sciences, the Hass disciplines have not developed at the same rate as international comparators. And I pick up on the word development here because uh, Alan's talk referred to this and, and I think this will probably be something we could go to in, in some detail in question time, I'm interested to know um, what is meant in this report by the Haas disciplines not developing at the same rate as international competitors. I, I, I assume it means that the uptake of the research infrastructure has not been as widespread. Um, but I also um, I wonder whether the sense of innovation or um, achievement in these discipline domains may be starting to be increasingly linked with the utilisation of research infrastructure and, it, and if those, that advanced infrastructure isn't being used then there's a sense that maybe the achievements that might be possible aren't being, you know, aren't being achieved. So I think there's a, a, a worrying coupling of research infrastructure with pure research um, innovation and achievement that, that really needs a little bit of looking at now. And the idea of having not developed at the same rate as international comparators. And I'm interested again in what those, which international comparators may be, um, you know, we should look to as examples of those that Australia and others in our region should be benchmarking against and what their achievements really are. Um, and a, a key question that sits behind all of this and which has been debated in Australia, but it's especially relevant for humanities and social sciences, is should there just be one infrastructure or many that interlock? And, if, and in what, what forms should they take? An argument for having one national infrastructure for humanities and social sciences is often that uh, it's impossible to get the funding to support any more than one. So whereas in the sciences there are very uh, custom specific um, infrastructures for particular scientific research programs that ranging from you know, medical to biological through to um, the study of space and that all require entirely different solutions. Um, that has been successful in attracting funding for those very specific areas of science and arguably is a requirement of their operation of those, of those disciplines. Um, but in the humanities, should we be making a stronger case that we should have um, infrastructure for linguistics, infrastructure for philosophy, for literature, for history, should they be different or is that, as it has been to date, a waste of time because um, the response has that's come back has been, no, you need to be better organised. Your discipline areas need to find ways of talking with one another. We need infrastructures that are much larger that um, can help to, and I really believe in the value of this, cross-pollinate ideas between disciplines that may have been siloed when they're actually very close to one another. Um, Um, but the question of size is also important um, because is it possible to have an infrastructure that where one size fits all, where um, the, or do the technologies that are being developed, um, can they be reapplied productively across dramatically different disciplinary domains and that, should that be a goal or should we be doing something or that's almost completely the opposite and developing um, purpose-designed approaches that fulfil certain requirements for very particular research needs. Or could the two things happen together? The two things happening together was the goal of the NECTA um, national e-research um, 
project that I've been heavily involved with, the idea that you could have these virtual laboratories which would um, allow for aggregation and bringing together an inter interoperability of, of data sources and, and collaboration between many people, and then that you would have specific tools that would be developed that would be able to sit on top of these virtual labs and perform certain functions, and that they could be interchangeable. Some may come and go, some may already be available in the marketplace, um, others might need to be developed anew. So that was its um, vision, and it's yet, yet to be clear, because the project's only just completed on a national level, you know, to what extent that has been successful. But I think the early indicators are that it is a good model, um, and that it is possible to have a large infrastructure with many small components, such as tools, that work with it. I think one of the um, one of the needs with our discipline areas is that in any development of infrastructure, we should also be thinking about how to better uh, reward and recognise the value of digital work in institutions. And so the policies around the development of infrastructure should or can, I, I, I would argue. Um, also support a greater recognition of the kind of people work that goes into and the expertise behind um, creating digital products. The research that it supports, that these infrastructures supports, needs to be reproducible, citable, rewarded, recognised, findable, um, preservable, published, reviewed, um, available for reuse, free to view if possible, although that's not always possible. So there are many other adjacent areas that are to do with valuing digital work, especially in the humanities and social sciences, that we should always bring into the discussion of the development of infrastructure. That's my, my firm belief. Now, my own interests lie in biography and history, and I'm interested in what kinds of infrastructure we need for these research fields in particular, and how do those needs relate to the needs of other fields and are, are they similar? So it's a specific way of asking some of those questions about whether a one-size-fits-all infrastructure is really possible or useful and whether that's what we should be aiming for. So I want to just turn briefly to a couple of major Australian projects that present biography and social history in new ways in collaborative virtual environments. And you tell this is all about biography, about people, about identity. Um, but the recent advances of, uh, of recent decades have radically changed the way that we harness, utilise and communicate our combined cultural knowledge and records. Across all disciplines, innovations in computing and media have had a transformational effect on the production of knowledge and on research methods. But I would argue that biography is a field that has particular relevance to digital methods and to digital humanities. And there are a number of reasons for this. First, digital forms of biography are expanding on a scale that was unimaginable or unpredictable, um, mainly due to social media, people recording their lives in, in new ways through um, social media networks. Millions, millions, billions of people. The second reason is related to the structure of the biographical enterprise. Biographers study the lives of individuals, not as isolated instances, but as they function within larger collective frameworks. And this corresponds with a dual micro-macro analysis approach that is a feature of much work in digital humanities, where discrete exemplars operate within the framework of vast data sets. This bringing together of approaches in biography has been enhanced and extended using techniques such as social network analysis. Uh, thirdly, the digital environments created a space for developing experimental hypertextual narratives that allow writers and producers of life stories to move away from the neat linearity of print towards a new kind of multidimensionality enabled by digital forms. This is a transformative change that's been going on over the past couple of decades and uh, is still really only just beginning.
But perhaps most importantly and relevant for our meeting today is that the aggregation of biographical data can produce entirely new understandings that wouldn't have been possible otherwise. We can understand this not just as a technological advance, but as connected from a much wider move from biography to history, from individual to collective social history of lives and historical experiences. Whereas once individual lives were studied in isolation, biography now understands individuals as part of much larger collectives and movements. So I want to refer to some of the issues that were faced in producing our National Biographical Dictionary in Australia, which, with which I've had personal experience. As it moved online, the development of its underlying infrastructure, its digital infrastructure, transformed it from a dictionary to a virtual research environment to such an extent that the term dictionary now appears to no longer apply so clearly. Uh, I'll then point to briefly to a major infrastructure initiative in Australia called the Humanities Networked Infrastructure, or HONEY as it's known, a service which aggregates data from more than Australia, 30 Australian data sources, including the Australian Dictionary of Biography. And biographical data is central to HONEY's data model. Now, the experience of these projects isn't, is specific to Australia, but I believe that the issues um, are, are generally faced by many research initiatives worldwide at, at this point when the digital is transforming our knowledge production in such profound ways and where this question of infrastructure and the underlying systems um, is on the cusp of locking in uh, our future choices in ways that may be very productive but could also be quite limiting. I was employed as the Deputy General Editor of the Australian Dictionary of Biography in 2009 to 13 and helped guide as part of a team the dictionary in the period it transformed from 30 years of print publication to a fully online and enhanced digital resource. The ADB, as I'll refer to it, is one of the most respected resources for Australian history. It was first published in 1966. It's the largest ever collaborative project in the humanities and social sciences in Australia, with over 4,000 authors and at any time over 100 people serving on working parties and a national editorial board. ADB today consists of around 13,000 concise scholarly biographies. They've been published in 18 volumes to date in print and are all now available online. By way of comparison, the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography has around 55,000 lives in its, its um, collection, but it also covers a vastly greater time frame. The ADB has always looked to the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography as a model, as an example, and there have been uh, there has been a relationship where editors have moved between the two projects and there's been consultation. And interestingly, now that the ODNB is fully online, it is reframing itself not so much as a dictionary, but as a curated collection. And um, that's been made possible because of the adoption of a new kind of infrastructure, a new understanding of what the dictionary is as a, new, a different kind of hybrid publication to a book, but also because new entries in that dictionary are now being published as sets and as, um, as mini collections around themes rather than in following um, A to Z or um, a chronological approach. And this is, this is a profound change in the way that that dictionary is being produced and the ADB is, is following in, in some ways. The Australian Dictionary of Biography was initially three projects. The first was the dictionary. The second was the process of ind indexing, which culminated in uh, 1991 with an index of the first 12 volumes of the ADB and has six, since been picked up in the digital environment in a new way, which I'll explain. The third aspect of the ADB was the card catalogue, and this still sits in, in the offices of the Australian Dictionary of Biography in the School of History. And 
It has around a quarter of a million cards, but they have practically no value, or at least they don't have the value that they were intended to have. They are um, a, a beautiful archival object, and, and yet they're, they're very rarely consulted. The decision was made not to digitise them all, because that wouldn't necessarily achieve the goal that was um, you know, the intended goal of, of making this material available without a huge amount of extra work in working with those documents and in um, making them actually useful. It became f clear when, my, um, when I first arrived in this job, which I was very, very proud to, um, to have been selected for, that I needed to understand how the basic editin editing environment actually operated. And this was the kind of work that was being done in 2009 when I started. Everything was in um, pencil and paper. And this project has the very best editors in Australia. It's, an, you know, it's a remarkable um, project, but the approach that was being taken was a tried and tested approach that had been in place for many, many decades. And I wasn't used to working um, this way. I was issued with a hole punch to um, hole punch the documents and put them on the archival file, the pencil and a sharpener. All documents were typed up by the administrator and a typist, although the research editors did use the web for research purposes. So this is an example, I think a classic example, of um, where analogue approaches had been extraordinarily successful in maintaining the standards of a national project for many, many decades and of the disruption that the digital would bring to the way of working. Positive disruption, I'd say. Um, at this stage, um, it was n not clear to me when I first started exactly how people worked together. It was when, in an environment where people were working in the corridor, consulting face to face. Um, you're reading some of this here. I love this colour. He, he kept in his office a collection of fine axes and regularly invited visitors to allow him to shave their arms or legs to demonstrate how sharp they were. This is an example of the kind of character colour that often is a feature of these short ADB articles which range from about 500 up to about 5,000 words with an average being around 750 words. I needed to understand exactly how the organisation worked. This is a team of 10 or more people who all had defined roles and so these were my early process diagrams to try and understand how the, the in-person um, exchange of ideas and um, editing work could be translated to a digital workflow. And this is all relevant to a conversation about infrastructure because the, the order, the process of actually doing the work in a digital environment is um, it has to be fairly rigid in order for it to be reproduced successfully. And, and yet in a corridor of people who had been working together for a number of decades, it, there could be a lot more flexibility. And so translating this into uh, a workable digital workflow um, was quite a challenge. And you can see in my notes, one of them says, try provocative ampu amputation where one element is dropped. And this comes from Edward de Bono's lateral thinking book, Simplicity, which is a great um, Bible, I think, in terms of simplifying processes. So some of these loops in pink were able to be dropped in the interests of, um, of getting to you know, a, a, an understanding that one person would be responsible for the work at one time and there would be a sequence. And the trigger for that um, sequence and understanding of who would be responsible at what time was still at this point something quite manual and physical. When the file was put in your box, it would be your turn to work on it. And then there was a digital system being developed. People would log in and, and start doing the work digitally. But the actual trigger for knowing it was your turn was still the archival file. And in fact, there's no way of getting away from paper in many of these large projects that have a long history. So partly the, the infrastructure of these projects is the documentation that has been built up in, for example, these hanging files on future entries for the dictionary. Um, sometimes it's been built up through contributions from the public um, over, over a period of many years. 
this was the whiteboard manager which was still used in 2009, a non-digital system to track the progress of articles as they moved through the system. Um, so they were magnets on a whiteboard, which I thought was an absolute thing of beauty in terms of systems design. Um, and, and again, to think about what we might do in a digital environment to, to find something that had, would work as efficiently as that for that group was a big challenge. For most of the production of Volume 18, which I was responsible for um, as in a managing editing capacity, we experimented with Microsoft's product, the online management system, uh, Windows Live, as it was known at the time, released in 2010 in Australia, which was quite timely, um, then renamed as SkyDrive and later OneDrive. This allowed for subjects to have um, their own files with multiple versions of the um, entries at various stages of editing held within. I wasn't confident for us to use the feature that Windows Live had, which was a versioning feature that allowed you to go back through versions of the single document. So we stored them in a, in a safer way. Um, but within that system, we could also do something for the first time, which was to create this um, it, this is a collaborative editing kind of environment that was within Windows Live that allowed a simple um, text file to be produced that had um, information about when an article had been edited, who had said what on it, and this had been produced in different ways in the analog time of the ADB through handwritten notes, but the being able to update this formed um, a kind of counterpart to those physical files being put into the into the individual research editor's um, pigeonholes. When the ADB first went online, it was a, it was a pioneer, and there was a lot of funding, including through the linkage infrastructure funding scheme of the Australian government that was put into developing the ADB online. But at that stage, if you compare it with how it is now, it largely replicated the print version. There wasn't the advanced functionality in search and visualization, for example, that there is now. It has been redeveloped now with much more functionality, and it's being transformed in the process into this infrastructure, this virtual infrastructure for historical research, and it's much more than a dictionary. But it's also allowed in the process for uh, some of the key issues that were criticisms of the dictionary to be addressed because they've, they can now be backed up with much more data. For example, um, representativeness has been a central consideration through the history of the ADB. Uh, this was a promotional um, poster produced in 1992 um, to advertise the first 12 volumes of the ADB and, and the newly published index with the title Australians All the first two words of the national anthem. And the, however extensive and varied the list of biographies in the ADB was, there were still always questions of how representative are they? How did these people qualify to have a biography <coughs> written about them? And these in turn relate to fundamental questions about what represents a life and for national projects, what represents a nation? And the analysis of the data that was possible uh, because all of these entries had been digitized, been put into the one system and could now be, um, could now be interrogated in entirely new ways, made it really apparent that there were so many more men than women, for example, that there were very few Aboriginal Australians, that certain occupations were, didn't feature at all. And the, this kind of analysis prompted all these questions again about how do you, if you were starting from scratch, how would you produce a national dictionary? Should it be based on, you know, what, what principles should it be based on in terms of representation? But a fundamental challenge, and I think at the heart of many of the problems and uh, well, uh, of the criticism is that the ADB only has 13,000 entries. It's estimated that nine million people died in Australia prior to 1990. And to create a really useful biographical research resource in the digital environment, there needed to be a plan to vastly increase the coverage. 
So the group behind the ADB and other projects of the, uh, the National Centre of Biography took two basic approaches. One was to increase the amount of biographical material that was published online by integrating and linking with other biographical resources, forming a large, much larger infrastructure. And the other was to much more comprehensively index the article, record much richer metadata to allow the interconnections between the biographical subjects to be visible in a way that they just simply couldn't be seen before. The key to this was the development of this project in 2011, I think it was. Obituaries Australia digitally republishes obituaries found in newspapers, magazines and journals and has had around 4,000 entries when I looked at it last time. But its goal is to republish all published obituaries. And again, this is something you could plausibly imagine doing in Australia because of its relatively um, young European history and the history of print publication. And what that's allowed is for um, a, a kind of correlation between entries of the in the dictionary and alternative readings of those people, multiple obituaries about people who have one authoritative article written about them in the National Dictionary can sometimes um, contest that authoritative version. So this has been a wonderful um, resource for, for scholars. But it also allows for many more people who don't have entries written about them in the Australian Dictionary of Biography to feature within what is effectively one li large combined data set that has different views on it through these different projects. They all sit within the same large database. Uh, I just, this is just an example of the gathering of much more rich metadata. You can see on the right hand side here um, all articles in the Australian Dictionary of Biography and Obituaries Australia now include birth and death, date and place, occupations, religious and cultural affiliations, causes of, cause of death, education, military service, workplaces, awards, associations with organisations, major events, rural properties and holdings, legacies created in the person's name, and the list goes on and, and I believe continues to expand. The original hyperlinks within the text were replaced in favour of these related entries um, which, uh, which include um, uh, relations, and, but also friends and even enemies, uh, other kinds of um, network members. Now this uh, indexing is manually intensive work to form this reliable infrastructure for interpretation and recording of information and the cataloging, uh, manual cataloging approach avoids much of the ambiguity in data um, that could be introduced through automated text mining of multiple sources, for example. Um, and there are many good experiments around the world that are showing the value of that kind of automated approach in generating new insights, especially across large data stores that couldn't have this manual work um, applied. But the ADB is, is proud as a national project of having some of the highest standards of factual verification of any such dictionary in the world. And so it was important to have a, a system that produced consistent, reliable results. So all this is prov providing the possibility um, to visualise these relationships in the dictionary in new ways, for example, through... Uh, family trees, but also through network visualizations. Although I think this still is limited to um, family relations, spousal relations, the future plan is to extend this over other relationships such as work, education, or perhaps even location of people. There's these other kinds of ways of seeing. In moving from print to digital, the Australian Dictionary of Biography looked to the experience of the ODNB, like I mentioned, and there's sometimes, very occasionally, been collaboration, direct collaboration between the two projects, um, such as in this project, which was uh, in relation to the 2006-7 Ashes Cricket Series. 
The top cricketers from each dictionary were profiled in a leaderboard linking back to entries in the separate resources, which is fantastic. And though there's another one um, that I particularly like, which has the front cover of the um, Beatles album, Sgt Pepper's album, with all the heads of all those people, and you can link back to into the various dictionaries, including those, the American National Biography, the ODNB, the Australian ADB. But um, there are barriers to this kind of development of a larger interconnected infrastructure for biographical research, and they relate to the ODNB being behind a subscription paywall and having a completely different commercial model. The Australian Dictionary of Biography has always been available freely online and will continue to be, and it's been supported from the outset by a special grant uh, through the uh, Australian National University to fund uh, pinnacle projects that uh, wouldn't otherwise be undertaken on a national scale, which was one of the founding kind of remits of the National University. Australia has many other large digital projects. I've already mentioned Trove, and the ADB does feed its data into Trove, so it's findable in Trove, but for contractual and intellectual property reasons, not all the data or all of the text is shared. Like most countries, Australia has many other large data set projects that feature biographical data that's extraordinarily valuable. And you can see here very familiar projects such as Austlit, Paradisec, the Pacific and Regional Archive for Digital Sources of Endangered Languages, um, the projects of the eScholarship Centre at the University of Melbourne, the Centre for Literary and Linguistic Computing at Newcastle, and there could be many others that could be mentioned in New Zealand that we'd add to, to this list. A common theme that links many of these diverse digital projects is the goal of capturing, preserving, building on and articulating the richness of, of Australian culture and history for current and future generations. And at the heart of many of these is biographical data. What are, would, it be, would it be possible to bring these data sets together and to integrate them with the authoritative biographical data in the Australian Dictionary of Biography? This was a question that a number of us asked in around 2010 when the Cultural Data Sets Consortium was founded. And this led to a proposal to bring together this consortium's approximately 30 resources into one virtual research environment and this was the foundation of what became the Humanities Networked Infrastructure Project. The challenge of course was that all these collections and resources were dispersed among multiple locations, institutions and agencies, mostly taking the form of standalone subject specific repositories with very different information architectures. So just in, in winding up now I want to briefly point to this HONEY project which was funded through the, the NECTA, the National E-Research Collaborative Tools and Resources Program in 2012 to 14, which is now launched and publicly available to registered users. It includes much of the data from the ADB as, many, as well as many other uh, major data sets from around Australia and it aggregates them. It's a discovery service, it's an aggregation service, but it also makes the data available for um, manipulation and reuse and as linked open data um, through an API and provides sets of tools for researchers to work with this data. Honey's goal is to combine and make accessible the data that forms the most important um, humanities and creative arts um, data sets, linking them together for the first time with information about the people, places, events and works that make up the country's rich cultural heritage. Honey's data model has six core entity types and people is one of the core entities. There are currently more than 290,000 persons in, in the humanities network infrastructure. This relates to our discussion about infrastructure and scale of infrastructure because one of the, the key rationales for this project was that cultural data is extremely laborious to collect, but that once collected, its scholarly value doesn't diminish over time. And I'm literally reading that, that 
sentence from the grant application that was put in. And this is a, um, the work towards this was a, a massive collaborative effort of people working out how they can work together, overcoming technical barriers to the, the many different um, information architectures that uh, are behind the different data sets. But it's my argument in, in um, talking about success about this project is that it's, the successes have been technological and we can think about them on the infrastructure level, but the real success has been on the cultural level, on the level of bringing people together, of creating um, a sense of the importance and shared vision for bringing together on a national level these, these important um, digital resources and unlocking and uniting them as the, as the motto has it. And you know, the person who is really behind the vision for this is Deb Verhoeven, who's its project leader at, De at Deakin, someone I greatly admire and have worked closely with in the digital humanities community. She and um, others, uh, you know, people representing these 30 or more organisations, found a shared vision to be able to go for this large funding and were successful in getting it. And now the challenge is to, to continue to build on the base. So in terms of infrastructure, what has been established is a precedent and a mode of cooperation, an existing project that could be built on in different ways um, to make Australia's wealth of cultural resources even more accessible and connected. And so I think I'll just finish on that note. Thank you. Australian Dictionary of Biography. Okay, yeah. Biography sorry. And you compare that to, uh, for example, in the US, the uh, um, Digital uh, Public Library of America, mm. uh, similar projects. What is a complicated question I don't only answer to because there's many sides. What should the future hold for the digital humanities in regard to the connection between nations mm. and infrastructures? Will we always be in a situation where we are building infrastructures for nations? If so, what are the strengths of that model and what are the limitations of that model? What might be an alternative? Mm. It's, a, it's, a big, it's a big question, obviously. Um, I, th I immediately think of the European example um, because um, Daria and Claren and other kinds of major funded infrastructure projects there have spanned national boundaries. And yet, arguably, this is a kind of nation building of a different sort. It's the building of, of Europe. And, it's, and so it, it's not, I, I wouldn't think to say that those projects somehow avoid the issue of doing something on the national scale um, and are doing it on a truly global scale. I don't think that's the case. I think it's very, very exciting what's happening there and the amount of funding that's been put towards it to bring together, especially across languages and cultures and all sorts of policy and funding divides, these wonderful resources in, in Europeana, those sorts of projects, absolutely fantastic. Um, but the, the question, and I, I, to not really respond to yours directly, but to open it to, the, to its logical extreme, which I'm interested in as a theoretical, conceptual thing, is you know, can we produce global knowledge through the interconnection of, of national projects? Or well, maybe they're not national, but they're large. They may be discipline specific. Some of them might be funded nationally, others mightn't be. Can, can we do it? Do we already do it? You know, is is the goal is the goal of infrastructure sometimes um, setting its own um, goals too high to be achievable? Are we always aiming for something which is um, a perfect global knowledge network that may not be possible? Um, and how much progress have we really made? If you look at some disciplines in the sciences, and I'm always struck by the comparison because some of these disciplines seem very well organised. They will say, oh no, we already have that virtual observatory for this or that. We, we share our data. We all cite things in the same way. Um, we cite each other. We work in different countries. Um, we've had this in place for many years. And so if you apply that back onto the humanities, 
um, I think that brings up the, almost the reverse question of the, the global, and that is, um, should we be going right back down to disciplinary, a disciplinary base or, or redefining our disciplinary roots in such a way that allows us to productively connect with people all over the world who are studying those very issues that we're concerned with? And somewhere in the middle, I guess, is probably going to be the best frame, but I'm not sure that we've yet found it. Hmm. Um, you mentioned before uh, earlier in the talk about the uh, question of uh, a single um, infrastructure or a single uh, set of, of tools for all hmm. humanities versus having a number of hmm. or, or a broader um, ecosystem, maybe you could say, of, of things like that. And I was intrigued by the kind of implicit, um, some of the implicit assumptions in the idea of there being the possibility of a single infrastructure mm. for the purposes of saving money or something like that. Um, because that implies that there's a kind of an us and them mentality that the digital humanities consume something that's built by someone else, as opposed to being the creators of something that they are interacting and working with mm. themselves. And also the idea that it, it almost implies that there is a, a concept of completion of an infrastructure. Mm -hmm that you, know, you have one infrastructure that's been designed to meet a set of requirements uh, and it's delivered and then that is the thing that is used. It doesn't allow for there to be continual um, uh, multi-dimensional attachments to this and, and enhancements and, mm. and adaption, adaptation and, and uh, refinement and so on. And, I, and I'm, I'm just wondering if, if maybe that question could be, um, I mean, it would be interesting talking to you further about that question, mm. just because it seems as though the implicit assumptions in it are, are actually limiting, perhaps. Well, it's a, it's a really interesting question and discussion that you know, to, to continue. Um, I, I can't help but be reminded of the um, people see a lot of promise in humanities having much closer dialogue with sciences or with adjacent fields, and I really believe in that. I think that we should be moving towards a, a much richer dialogue across our discipline areas. But at the same time, there's a kind of, um, it, in, in terms of infrastructure funding, you have to stake out your spot and, and you have to, in terms of actually applying for funding and being successful in that endeavour, say that you're going to do something and finish it, or finish it to an extent that it's available then for others to build upon or will be use, useful and utilised. And so that's a very pragmatic, instrumental thing. And, and the idea of being able to use different tools and plug them in and borrow them or develop them from within or that is part of that narrative of versatility and you know sort of using this thing that's been been had a lot of investment in but I also think it's really a, a good ethos for the humanities we we don't need to be completely bound by our own ways of, of seeing and doing in terms of our theories and our approaches we can borrow from adjacent disciplines and I think the role of humanities of, is often one of critique and reflection and mirroring back on those disciplines and I think in terms of infrastructure development we can do a similar thing um, some of the wonderful resources that have been developed for honey for example, the um, social, um, social linking, which is a feature of it. I'll show you a short video if we have time, maybe afterwards in questions, um, that um, allow new, for, new links to be made within the aggregated data. I mean, this would be fascinating if it was reapplied in scientific contexts. Um, so I think there's some sharing that can be, that is possible and that we should be part of. Um, it's a big question. I'd like to talk with you more about that.